Growth has produced crowding, pollution, starvation, species extinction, and social conflict. People at the Montreal North American Degrowth Conference suggested replacing cars with bikes, eating less meat, consuming less things that turn to trash, downsizing, rebuilding spiritual connections to Mother Earth, putting in controls that lower stratification between the rich and the poor, and between the weak and the strong. Presentations described a wide range of problems and their solutions, however, no report or panel integrated all the problems and solutions to answer the questions how much degrowth is enough to create a global civilization that continuously delivers wonderful lifestyles while limiting inequity, preventing social conflict, and saving the environment. Had this report been written, Part of it would have resembled the one created by NASA engineers who designed this space station. The design provided supporting resources and space for three people, a plan that was eventually scaled up to support six. Those engineers were pretty nervous when the space shuttle brought 13 people for a short visit. If the shuttle could not return to Earth, the toilets designed for six would overflow. So here we are on Earth in the same predicament, with 7 billion passengers. Earth's atmosphere overflows with CO2, streams never reach their seas, mountaintops get pushed into valleys, wildlife has no place to live, and the rich crush the poor. If we ask NASA engineers to design global communities that don't have these problems, for example, a community in the Pacific Northwest that supported all the people in North America. That project would provide a way of calculating how much degrowth is enough. To start their analysis, think of civilization as a group of people supported on a plate. The plate is hanging from a chain. If any link in the chain breaks, civilization is destroyed and people die. These red links reflect resource limits, water, soil, energy, and minerals. These links reflect process limits, photosynthesis, biotoxicity, climate instability, and thermodynamic entropy. These gold links reflect elements of the social framework, rule of law, specialization of labor, economies of scale, and stratification of wealth and power. A peaceful, sustainable civilization breaks no links today or in the future. Actually, we don't have to know the breaking strength of every link to know how much degrowth is enough. We just have to calculate the breaking strength of the weakest link. Let's begin a search for the weakest link by investigating our civilization's load on the energy link. The load is defined as the difference between energy deliveries and energy use. And when deliveries are less than use, the tank empties and the link breaks. To calculate energy use, we need to know how much energy it takes to support one person, how much it takes to transport him and his goods, how much it takes to build and maintain his home, deliver and prepare his food, make and clean his clothes, create his toys, power his services, maintain his military and government, create and maintain his infrastructure, provide his entertainment and recreation, and deliver 12 to 20 years of full-time education. Let me choose, for the sake of making the first of many calculations, the energy needed to support the average American. I realize that most of you will find his consumption obscene. However, we can downsize him if we find this degrowth estimate too demanding. If it takes 96 quadrillion BTUs of energy to support 306 million Americans, it takes 300 million BTUs per year to support one. It's enough energy to continuously light 110 100 watt light bulbs. Wait a minute. Most Americans do not turn on that many lights. A family of four uses only enough electricity to light three of these continuously burning bulbs. That means 97% of the energy he or she uses does not pass through the home's electric meter. It's delivered in the form of petroleum for transportation or natural gas for home heating, or it comes embedded in all these goods and services. Here is a graph of where the energy comes from. 
Natural gas, coal, and petroleum provide 83%. Biomass, the burning of our civilization's waste and the creation of alcohol, provides 4%. Nuclear reactors provide 9%. Hydroelectric plants provide 3%. And solar, wind, and geothermal provide 1%. How will the future affect these deliveries? The history of human energy use looks like this. Today, we live in a time of abundant energy. We might call it the fossil energy age. A hundred years ago, we used little energy. Today, we are near the peak use. And in a hundred years, during the lifetime of our children, fossil energy use will drop to near zero. There will be coal and oil and gas left in the ground, but it will take more energy to get it out and use it than it delivers. If this is true, 83% of today's energy won't be available. Nuclear power plants run on uranium from mines. Like oil and coal, there is a point where it takes more energy to get uranium out of the ground than the energy the uranium can produce. By some estimates, that point is at the end of this century. So this 9% won't be available either. Within a hundred years, we will not have this fossil fuel supported infrastructure that allows us to grow corn and make ethanol. Nor will we have this throughput uh, to create biomass waste to burn in cogeneration plants. Essentially, this 4% won't be available. We'll still be able to heat our homes with wood from a, a woodlot, but don't plan on the woodlot supporting your symphony, your health care, or your job. Which brings us to this line. All of us want to believe wind, solar, and other renewable energy installations will replace diminishing deliveries of fossil and uranium energy. However, this form of wind turbine analysis shows these beliefs may be fantasy. Let me present it step by step. Wind turbine projects have periods of construction, operational lifetime, and decommissioning. These maroon triangles reflect dollars required to complete tasks during these periods. The blue triangles represent kilowatt hours sold to customers. The maroon can be compared to the blue after the kilowatt hours are converted to dollars and depicted as this orange column. And the maroon triangles already in dollars are the investment adjusted for tax breaks and investment grants and depicted as this column. The difference between the two is the project's lifetime income. This income can be divided by the project's investment to give EROI, dollars of energy returned on investment. EROI analysis makes investors happy because it tells if investing in wind turbines is better or worse than investing in offshore drilling. But our NASA design team is not interested in income. They are interested in usable energy to support a peaceful modern civilization. They need to know the net energy of wind turbines, which is the kilowatt hours a wind turbine produces, the blue column, minus the energy used to create it, this red column. The trouble is the maroon triangles are in dollars, not in energy units. The engineers must determine the energy required to manufacture, deliver, install, connect to the grid, and train and support staff. Plus, the energy used to create the roads, bridges, trucks, rail, manufacturing plants, and educational facilities. After quantifying investment energy, one can calculate the wind turbine's net energy contribution to civilization. Engineers can also calculate productivity of each energy process by dividing net energy by energy invested to get this different EROI, which is energy returned on energy invested. For example, the calculations show that corn ethanol produces 1.2 barrels of energy for every barrel used in its production. Tar sands gets 4 barrels of energy for every input barrel. Photovoltaics get 12 kilowatts out for every kilowatt used in production. Windmills have EROIs near 18, and petroleum production varies. Reservoir exhaustion lowers EROIs, while technology raises them. For example, when reservoirs were full in 1900, it took the energy in one barrel of oil 
to get 100 barrels to market. Today, petroleum eroys have dropped below 20. Conversely, the eroys of wind production have risen, and after these two curves intersect, wind looks like a better energy source for NASA's new community. However, the wind's eroy calculations are misleading. First, in our civilization, this infrastructure is used by millions of cars each year. When prorated, this wind turbine delivery truck can be assigned but a small part of the bridge's embedded energy. However, if there were no cars in the new civilization, the wind turbine project would be assigned 100% of the energy required to build and maintain this bridge. Second, our infrastructure was created with a cascade of sub-projects, each with its own embedded energy, and each with investment energy to make that energy. When oil and coal within eroids of 40 to 60 were used to complete bridge projects, the investment energy was small. When this bridge was rebuilt with wind turbine energy, eroids of 18, investment energy will be much bigger. This error in the eroid analysis is just the tip of the iceberg. To fully understand it, visualize the world without fossil and nuclear energy as an island with only wind energy sources energy invested will be bigger. The net energy will be smaller. Wind eroids may get too low to support a modern civilization. If eroids of renewable energy production get too low, they will not be able to replace fossil fuels. In a hundred years, even this 1% may not be available. We may be running civilization on this 3% of today's energy deliveries. It will be provided by these large dams built with fossil fuels but potentially maintained by the power they produce. True, even hydroelectric projects do not last forever, but they might last 500 years before they silt in, even silted in. They still produce the same energy, it's just not evenly distributed throughout the year. In 500 years, with high levels of technology, maybe we'll find a way to store energy or even a new energy source. However, this technological advancement depends on the existence of a peaceful, modern civilization during the next 500 years. Technology won't advance if civilization collapses into conflict. In summary, without the creation of new energy sources, energy deliveries on the North American continent could decline to 3% of present which means energy use for the residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation will also decline to 3%. 3% of the energy will support only 3% of the U.S. population, or about 10 million people. If everyone on the North American continent desires to live the average American lifestyle, the 32 million Canadians, the 306 million Americans, and the 144 million Central Americans, which sum to 480 million, will have to decrease to a total population of 10 million people. How much degrowth is enough? This estimate, a 98% population reduction. I can hear your moans all the way to my house in Kansas. We don't have to live like Americans. We can live smaller. We can stop flying. We can put eight people in every car. We can put eight couples in every bedroom, eat like vegans, have one-eighth the clothes, one-eighth the gadgets, one-eighth the services, one-eighth the military and government, one-eighth the infrastructure, one-eighth the symphonies and baseball parks, and eight kids can share the same textbook. If you're willing to implement this downsize, the same energy can support eight times 10 million or 80 million people. Then, an 83% reduction is enough degrowth. Molly wants to know how soon will the degrowth have to be completed? Within your lifetime, Molly. And if we don't do it, Molly asks, this energy link will break, your civilization will crash, and Molly, it's going to take you down with it. In closing, how much degrowth is enough? 83 to 99 percent depending on desired standard of living. Checking the breaking strength of other links, for example, soil, climate, rule of law, produce similar degrowth estimates. A word of caution. When you calculate how much degrowth is enough, 
Be honest about people striving for a better life and be careful about consigning future generations to a diminished lifestyle. They might want to commit genocide before they accede to your plan. And finally, most of all, don't underestimate the injuries associated with civilization collapse.